Uh, we have some sad news and some happy news to share. Uh, first of all, if, if you have not heard, Jim Bargainer, who was to present with us next month, sadly died in December. So our program will be dedicated to him next month. And our exciting news is that Cassandra Kavnis is now the leader of the reading group. You are going to be hearing from her in more of our discussion programs. You heard from her at our first reading group meeting this year, got us off to a great start. She has recently also been appointed to the Mayor's Young Professional Council. She's doing a lot of exciting work in the community and evolving her role at the museum. So welcome, Cassandra. Welcome, Cassandra. Yes, Congratulations. Yes. And also the, the good news about the new baby. Yes, we do have a new <laughs> baby. Yes, Sarah had her baby Alden on Monday. Oh, so things to celebrate at the world in the world right now. And of course, Amy is our partner representing the library, the museum and the library are so excited to keep working together. And as Amy reminded me yesterday, soon we'll all be reporting to the uh, new cultural affairs director and um, continue to grow our partnerships. And I know she and Cassandra will have some creative approaches to art and letters. And Amy has been at the Bertha Williams branch for six years and she's also an artist. Uh, so this is really a perfect fit for her. She does, she does a lot of pet portraits, but it's also very um, much of a social justice advocate and, and certainly was excited about this topic. So with no further ado, again, welcome to the new leader, Cassandra, and welcome to our speaker, Amy. Great to see everyone. Okay, so um, as Alice said, my name is Amy Campbell. I am the librarian over at Bertha Williams on Rosa Parks. Um, I've actually been over here for about four and a half years. I've been with the system for six years, but that's, that's nitpicking. So, <laughs> uh, but I have been over here for a while um, and uh, I have only been an artist for about two years. I started March, 2019 um, and I started with King's Canvas. That's Kevin King got me involved in starting art. And uh, I've made, I think at this point about $5,000 in sales. Good for you. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Not too bad for, for just starting. <laughs> it's, it's helped me out with, with some vacations and some home repairs, so I'm not mad at it. Um, so I also come from a line of uh, artists. My mother is a quilter herself. Um, I believe my grandmother also did some quilting, but um, I, I don't know that I've seen any samples of her work. But my mother quilts constantly. I also do fiber arts. Um, I'm more of a cross stitcher, although I've done crochet knitting uh, and piecing quilts before, uh, but cross stitch is my go-to. I do find that that helps me a lot with blending colors in, in my, um, my painting. So I mostly work with acrylic. Uh, so uh, I do have a slideshow. It's really, really short. So I'm not going to be talking a whole lot. It's mostly going to be a uh, conversational space. This is just kind of give us something to look at and jump off of. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Okay, so as a librarian, I am always interested in looking at objects as data. So we're not talking about just the object itself and what it presents to us automatically, but also the information about the object. So what is meta metadata? metadata? Uh, it's information about information. In regards to quilts, it's going to be who made the quilt. So the quilters, the piecers, those are the people that so the blocks, a lot of the times you'll have a uh, group, group quilting where everybody makes different, so they would all be piecers. And then you have um, finishers. So if you have someone who's putting together the whole thing uh, and doing the backing and that kind of thing, that's your finisher title of quilt or quilt pattern. Then you have down to the structural metadata, which is size, shape, materials used 
And in regards to objects and art, you have to consider also purpose and function, storage, display requirements, and whatever data is relevant to the collection. So for instance, if it's uh, done by a group of uh, African-American artists, that's something to consider metadata wise for your collection. So um, I'm gonna have information on the quilts after these questions here. So looking at this quilt, we see that it is uh, a strip quilt. And so looking at how it's constructed, I'm sorry, I can't talk today. This is great, great start. All right, looking at how it's constructed, we can kind of assume some things about why it was made this way. Uh, why the pattern was made this way. Someone was probably looking to use up small scraps, but they also had larger scraps. This may actually have been a quilt that was repurposed where they had a backing that was starting to wear out, but they didn't want to just throw the whole thing out. So that's something to consider when you're looking at um, objects as art, as well as, as objects as information. And this was actually made by um, Mary Maxton. She is an African-American quilter. Uh, it was completed in 2000. And it is part of the Montgomery Museum of Arts Fine, Fine Arts Collection. So this one's more complicated. Um, None of those at the museum. I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay. So go ahead and take a look at, at what differs from this quilt as the previous one. This is a little bit more of a complicated um, pattern. You're not just doing strips, you're doing uh, blocks. So you're sewing both vertically and horizontally. Does anyone wanna guess um, whether this quilt is newer or older than the previous one? Based on how it appears, well, say older. Older, I would say. Okay. Um, this one is older significantly, uh, and you can kind of see that based on some of the staining, uh, as well as the fact that there's more muted colors. And uh, you wouldn't know it just by looking at it, but if you had this quilt in front of you, you would be able to tell that this is primarily um, cotton. So since there are no polyfibers in it, it is much older. So this is actually from 1865. So significantly older than our previous quilt. And then we have this one. So, and I did select this one uh, since the book talks about the Underground Railroad. Um, but given the selection of the colors, do you think there's a message to this quilt? And what, what do you think it is? Anyone can answer this. Well, I'm sure there's a message. I'm not sure I can figure it out, but there's bound to be. Okay, well, I have some additional questions there uh, with the slide that kind of might prompt you a little bit. Do you see any symbols? Well, yeah, I, I see the bow tie. Mm -hmm. And I see that that ramble round thing at, at the at the bottom. Um, goodness gracious! And I guess the um, patriotic uh, motif towards it. Yeah, uh, and, and, I, and, and, all, and and also you know, northwest and southwest. Um, hmm. It's hidden in plain view. <laughs> So it's interesting that you said bow ties because I see, um, oh, what do you call well, them? Hourglass. Hourglass, thank you. Right. You're right. I don't know why that word left my head. Uh, so I see hourglasses. So, I mean, I don't know the intent that the artist had here um, because I haven't spoken directly with the artist, but it seems to me like it is, if, if there is a coded message in this that is trying to tell, you know, you're gonna do a certain amount of time. Um, I also see this looks like a railroad to me. Yes. 
Yeah, I, I, I think it definitely tells you that you're going somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I do find that the, uh, the use of colors is interesting uh, just because this is an American made quilt. And so those are considered patriotic colors. And of mm -hmm. course, ideally our country stands for freedom. So, and this was made by the Elizabeth Baptist Church Senior Citizens Quilting Group. And it is called Underground Railroad Under the Stars. So you also have your star patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, the, the background uh, uh, seems kind of like the sky. You it know? does seem kind of like the sky, doesn't it? I yeah, don't know. Yeah. Uh, that is a flowered um, pattern looking a little bit closer at it. Okay. But it does, standing back from it, it does seem like a star. And then you also have your, um, your star patterns up here. Mm -hmm. So um, looking at quilts solely as pieces of information, um, what, what can we tell about who made them? Oh, Not necessarily these, but like if you were to go to somebody's home and they had a quilt on their bed, what, what information do you think you could learn from that? Well, you get information from word of mouth. You may get information from a signature. You get information from the stories that um, people tell about them. Okay, so that's that's actually connected to a, a primary source. You're talking about oral traditions right there. So you're talking mostly to the person who owns the quilt, but even just looking at the quilt itself. Wouldn't it depend on, on the age of the quilt? It might. Um, but you can tell a lot of that information by what fabrics are used. Uh, you have information on the quilt based on what size it is. So a person who is, has a quilt that maybe doesn't fit the bed may have recently bought a new mattress and still <laughs> loves the, the quilt that's sized for a twin size mattress and they just <laughs> want to keep it, but it doesn't fit the queen size. And Amy, I see you have an answer in the chat. Paula Susan said a quilt might tell us about what clothes somebody wore. I was sort of just thinking the same thing, what they had around the house they used. Uh, also, and I, I did not do this and I wish I had because I used to sew a lot for our daughter and I, I should have, I saved you know fabric, but I gave it all to Makoa when I was cleaning house because someone said later, I should have taken those pieces of fabric from all those outfits I made for her and made had them made into a quilt, which would have been so wonderful, you know, but hindsight, anyway. Um, yeah, and that, that even includes as far back as like generational because a lot of quilters, especially if they're family members will hand scraps down. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can have generations worth of uh, material appearing in different quilts. So it's even sort of a lineage thing um, mm -hmm. which quilters know who. So I think that's interesting <laughs> if you look. There's, there's a lot of scholarship that could be gone <laughs> uh, quilting and whatnot, but it's seen as more of a craft instead of an artistry and crafts aren't given some of the same gravita gravitas and respect <laughs> as art. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Amy. Amy. Yes. One of the fun things is that years ago, I took t-shirts for my husband's races because he used to participate in marathons and half marathons mm -hmm. and took them to someone who made them into a quilt that we have. So that's, that's cool. kind of a history of one of his activities, you know, that can be handed down. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, I think people have been doing that for a a while now and that's also another really interesting thing and of course t-shirt fabric isn't super you know durable um but those those are also very going to be very interesting history models i think uh yeah, it was done several years ago so mm -hmm. but it's also it's unfortunate because those are the types of uh pieces of information that even though they can tell us a lot about a person or a group of people um, it's the kind of stuff that gets overlooked as historical information. Maybe I think too the how the, the condition of the quilt that's on the bed. If 
you walk in there and the condition of the quilt is in excellent shape, the person just may put it out there for visitors. Right. And if it's worn, they probably have it on there. You know, they use it all the time. That, that's a good point. Um, you, you can see how a person uses the quilt based on where it's worn. Does this person write in bed? Do they, do they drink coffee in bed? You know, you're gonna see those stains. Those stains are information as well. Uh, so you're not even talking about just, just the material, but the condition of the material is, is information as well. Mm -hmm. It also tells you how well the quilt is made. If um, you've got a fairly new looking quilt, but you've already got a pop seam, like you're probably talking about somebody who's just started quilting or maybe doesn't have a really good sewing machine or sewing skills. So that's also information to look at. Um, can you guys think of uh, any other sort of everyday objects that might tell you something about an individual or a group of individuals? Uh, spam. Spam. <laughs> spam? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm answering my husband's phone. <laughs> Oh, sorry about that, y'all. Give me more information about the spam. I want to know. <laughs> I was thinking coffee cups. Mm -hmm. Yep, coffee cups are a good one. So, um, books on a bookshelf. Books, books on a bookshelf are a really good one. Uh, if if I see some certain books on someone's bookshelf, I'm gonna look at them a little funny. Um, so that's that's a really good one. Uh, music as well, although most of us have music on our phones now so at least people my age amy to answer your question and then to go back to something you said from the previous one anything in people's environment that they choose to put out is a reflection of their values their lifestyles and um preferences and or needs Newcast. to go back to go back to saying okay. that aren't that the quilts were not recognized as, as art uh, in 1971, the Whitney Museum had what was considered a groundbreaking exhibit based upon uh, it was an exhibit of quilts and it was one of the first times that the crafts quote unquote made their way into the fine art world and were um, just opposed to the contemporary art of the day to be viewed as abstractions. But it's interesting when you think about it because um, when you think about the people who were doing, uh, you know, the, the arts even earlier, you know, you go back to um, uh, uh, some of the earlier modern artists who were using African influence to create their art or to influence their art. This is actually many years later that the Whitney called on with looking at the quilts because it was looking now from um, uh, both sides, from the creating of paintings and comparing quilts to paintings and looking at them both in comparison as modern illustrations and abstractions. I have a question. Okay. I know you you were talking about the modern quilts and I was just wondering, are there quilts today that tell stories like the one uh, you're showing there? Actually, there uh, yes, uh, this next slide. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Big way. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> So this, I was, yes, I saw that one. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we have had this on display at the museum. Yeah. Right. So, I saw that. Now mm -hmm. we have, uh, so oh, excuse me, I'm trying to like, my thoughts are all over the place today. So now that we've gotten away from having to code messages in quilts we can be a little more forthright with it and by we I, I mean um, artists in general but uh, specifically black quilters are able to be a little more forthright and use the quilt more as an art form especially as it has become a more acceptable art form as um, I'm sorry I forgot the name of who presented that information for us. Lisa so, Newcomb. 
Lisa, thank you. So um, yeah, now we are seeing quilts that are less, I'm not gonna say structured, but less geometrical. So they have more storytelling aspects, uh, but th there were also storytelling aspects in quilting in other um, cultures as well. But this, this is a newer one, obviously. So we can look at it and see what the quilt is depicting. So we've got, we've got some information here. We know it was set in Alabama. We got the Alabama flag here. We've got the Confederate flag over the American flag, might I add. Um, and we got a lot going on here. So mm -hmm. is this art, is it functional? Uh, what is the purpose? And does it achieve that purpose? Oh, it's telling many stories, telling many stories. And I personally, it definitely achieves its purpose in my mind. I think when we had this up, um, you could tell that it achieved its purpose when fifth graders immediately knew exactly what was going on in the picture in almost every one of the pictures. So I felt like it, it definitely achieved the purpose of instruction of, of what, what the history of maybe black voting, black lives, whatever, but um, the, the fifth graders picked it up quickly. So yeah. it's very instructive. What was their yeah. reaction to that? Because I'd be interested to see how um, our, our younger people mm -hmm. well, they, they immediately just pointed out the other the docents can respond to they, they just yeah. immediately pointed out and picked the different yeah. pieces on there and knew exactly what each one was about the Jackie Robinson quilt in the same way they came up yeah with things right I didn't even remember about baseball players but they, they knew oh and, and and also the uh, the Helen Keller one remember the Helen remember Helen Keller but y'all um uh, I think that fifth graders are not going to show emotion that an adult would. Um, at least that's been my experience with teaching. Um, sometimes they don't realize the enormity of a symbol uh, that an adult would. So uh, I'm like Frank, I don't remember them uh, making any you know, outstanding comments. Is it that they don't know the enormity of the symbol or that they don't have the context to understand exactly how impactful that symbol is? Oh, both, both, honey. Um, um, I'd, I'd like for somebody who can see it better than I can to tell me some of the details. I don't know what's going on in the left hand bottom corner or the one above that. And I'm not sure about the blue square. I can't tell whether that's a cemetery or, uh, or what. Um, I, I, I just can't see it clearly. And if I do, I'm not sure what I'm seeing. Yeah, I see. Um, so in the upper left hand, that is the cemetery there. That um, one's clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's next to it? The, the one to the right. It, I can't figure out what's going on there. Looks like a body. Yeah, I, I assumed it was like a graveyard. Well, that's what I wondered, but I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what all that white. The, the, blue, the blue one, is that what you're asking about? Yes, yes, yes. That's yes. George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door. Is that under <gasps> oh, oh, my goodness. Thank you. So much of four little girls who were murdered in the 16th Street church bombing. Yeah, but there's yeah. only one girl shown, or am I missing it? Um, I think you you see the student approaching George Wallace as uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Lucy, and then to the left, yeah. the graves of the four oh, that were lost yeah, in the 16th four, Street four. church bombing. Okay, you're on a roll. How about below the below the four girls? What is what's going on there? It looks almost like a paw coming down. Amy, do you want me to keep going? Yes, please do because um, I selected this more as a, as a talking point. I don't know a whole lot about this specific work, so. Oh, thank you. So below that is the shallow grave that Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman were found in Mississippi in 1964 during Freedom Summer after they were abducted and murdered. And so that is the one scene um, from, from a neighboring state, as Amy talked about very much about 
the story of America, the story of Alabama, um, but also has that reference to um, the martyrs of the Mississippi Freedom Summer in 1960. And you're talking about the one with the moon, what looks like the moon? Yes. Wow, I would have never gotten that. Okay. It's probably the hardest to read, mm -hmm. um, but that is, as I understand it, and, and Jennifer, please jump in, but what that is, or Sandra, but that is what it is meant to represent, as I understand it. And kids got these in their historical context? Wow. Oh, oh uh, um, I, I would say um, specifically each, each uh, symbol or design, no. But they certainly recognized the crosses. They certainly recognized that it's a graveyard. They certainly yeah. recognized the, the flags. And, yes. And the, at the bottom, the hanging on the tree. I mean, yes. there's certain things that they definitely could, re could recognize. Mm -hmm. What about the bottom left-hand corner? I, I keep seeing an RV there, so I don't know what that is. The bus. It's a bus. Oh, it's for busing. Okay. Yeah. So I okay, just select this you. because it, it is a lot of um, visual information, but if you yeah. don't have the context of, of what what happened historically, you I mean, you you can get a feel for it, but you're not gonna know exactly what the context is. Uh, so this leads into um, another question of what is the best way to pass along information? I mean, we've got the oral traditions, we have just basic. I think it's a great recording of history there. Yes. It is. Mm -hmm. If you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I but mean, un unfortunately, screens do have some limitations. In yeah, yeah. Well, and and I'm using a small yes. iPad. But a lot of thought went into making it. Absolutely. Uh, oh, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you all for helping me see it. I'm extremely interested in this kind of thing, subject matter and quilts. And uh, I I'm now appreciate this particular one a hundred times more than I did before I liked it visually. Mm -hmm. And you can see these a little bit better um, on the Montgomery Museum of Art Fine, uh, Fine Art website. So th this is part of their searchable collection. Thank you. I did want to add something to uh, Lisa's comment about the Whitney it was a, a really important milestone. But another thing that had a tremendous impact was actually the bicentennial, the US bicentennial had a tremendous influence on more and more women taking their history uh, seriously and using quilting to do that. I did the bicentennial book of East Tennessee and of the Smoky Mountains, and that was the cover story. Um, because quilts are so important up there and because that time period was so important in catapulting quilts, not particularly black quilts, but quilts. Okay, so what, uh, going back to my question, what's the best method of, of data storage? We have written, visual, oral, digital. Um, what do you think is going to preserve information intact? And I'm asking this as a librarian because I there there is no good answer. Um, <laughs> so, but it is a really it's always been a really interesting discussion in in uh, my library classes. So I'm interested to see. What you all think. My my sense is is that it needs to be multidimensional. That each of our resources that you just mentioned are at risk. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and also that it needs to continue to evolve with time because just as um, uh, CDs, you know, gave way, I mean, not CDs, what were they? Tape players gave way to VCRs, gave ways to CDs, gave way to digital. Um, we are in a rapidly changing environment in terms of storing and uh, people being able to read different pieces of technology. Um, they no longer have the technology to read things that were done with technology that's now 20 years old. Um, but also one of the things that is at risk is um, having the actual uh, objects because one can see something digitally like Dolly was just explaining on a small scale, flat, 
um, you know, it's hard to read what you're seeing where when you're seeing something and you're looking at it physically as in a museum, the impact is much more dynamic. The scale becomes dynamic, the regularity or irregularity of the stitching becomes an element that you can't begin to see with some sort of mechanical storage. And, um, and books, um, though uh, they can be wonderful, are um, more and more getting uh, ignored. And so um, uh, it really is, you know, it's a fight to keep information um, active, accessible, and interesting to people. Mm -hmm. You made some really, really good points. Um, and so every time that you remove a piece of information from its original element, you lose information. Once, once a painting has left the artist's hands and gets sold to a viewer, um, you lose the information that the artist has when they created that piece. So for instance, this is one of my pieces. Oh. So, oh, nice. <laughs> I do mostly pet <laughs> portraits. And um, just looking at this, you're like, okay, they're, they're cats in space and there's this weird little creature up at the top. That's a tardigrade, by the way. And, um, so these cats are actually named after, um, I always mix up his name. So it's Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think is the correct order of that. It's either Neil deGrasse, yeah, Neil deGrasse Tyson or Neil Tyson deGrasse. Yeah. <laughs> He's got so many last names that uh, I mix them up occasionally. So both of those um, did the Cosmos series. So at the bottom here, you have the covers from both of their Cosmos series. And then up top you have uh, Sagan's Voyager because he was part of that that program so that's the Voyager satellite up there and then in the background Mars so the person who commissioned me said that their favorite their favorite astrological body was Mars so that's that's what's in the background there so that person knows those connections but just looking at this piece you're like well they're, they're cats in space that's cool whatever so but again if you're removed from the artist and the person who commissioned the piece, you've lost that information of why those symbols are back there. Uh, and that's also true in digitizing stuff like quilts, um, even, even, even books. I mean, you lose information when you digitize books because the type of paper that it's printed on can give you information. So you have, for instance, your, your pulp books, um, those deteriorated really, really quickly, but they were, they were intended to be really cheap, affordable, accessible uh, stories. And then they were meant to kind of disappear. So that's information that is potentially lost to us later that we can get back through digitizing but you do still lose information by not having the physical object. Um, so digitizing is great for access. It does prevent loss of information though. Um, I would actually argue that oral traditions are one of the stronger ways of uh, preserving information. And that's because you still have that, if not direct, communication line um, with the person who experienced it, you at least have some sort of cultural context with that person. And you guys can argue with me because. <laughs> Amy, I think in an ISIL, just speaking in an isolated incidence, it doesn't really matter what medium you used of all the different media you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think the important thing is that after viewing that media or medium, you, um, you have discussion 
because even in the old the, the quilts of the uh, of the railroad, there was always you had to have someone explain what those symbols were. Uh, in the the piece that we saw by Yvonne Wells, I mean the the fifth graders knew the symbols, but they didn't know the discussions behind them. Mm -hmm. So that became important, just as in your piece that we wouldn't get the whole deal with your discussion afterwards, it became a lot clearer. So I think as long as the discussion follows and, and a, a chance to, to talk about the, uh, the picture that you're viewing uh, or the, the quilt that you're viewing, um, it's more important to have that discussion. Okay, but what happens when you, you aren't able to have that discussion? Then you lose it, just like I would. I was completely lost before reading the book if I had seen the, the quilts from the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. I just would have thought, "Oh, there's some stars. That's pretty." And you know, this this is a strange, a, a strange design. But you know, having read the book, you know, I understand a heck of a lot more. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you just you you do. You're right. You lose things if you don't if you don't have discussion or some information beyond it, which makes mm -hmm. you know your data <laughs> very mm -hmm. important that you talked about. <laughs> well, and I also think that uh, often discussion has different um, input coming in. My, my grandfather uh, came to the United States when he was an infant, so he had no memory of where he came from. When he was uh, in the mid-1960s, um, awarded an opportunity to go down to out of the country to go to an island country and uh, go fishing. He went to get his passport. Well, um, he thought he was born in the United States. Um, they said he, he wasn't born in the United States. There was, no, there was no birth certificate. So he went around to his old neighborhood where he grew up where mostly people had moved away. And he, she, he ran into a babysitter who said, well, you know, you came over from England, I kind of remember your mother saying. Well, another cousin that he talked to years later said that the family was from Russia. Well, did they go from Russia and then use the port of England but never lived in England? One never knows when storytelling is um, oral and not supported by document and often where there's conflicting um, uh, curiosity about what that story is. And I have many stories within my family system where memory is um, um, pierced with, uh, I'm not sure, but passed on that way and, um, and conflicting perceptions. So uh, oral is, is important if, if it's not shared orally but again, that sense of having multiple formats to reinforce it, to help to maintain it through the ages, I think it has, has deep value to it. I'm going to guess you dabble in genealogy because I've experienced a lot of this going back through my family history. So, no, I, I don't. No, oh, I'm okay. just, this is just life experience. Okay. And, and using it as a reference to, to counterbalance my concern that oral has value, but the information that one gets orally from different members of the family is not always consistent. Sure. You know, my, my, another uncle grew up thinking that his name was Milton. When he went to get his birth certificate, he found out his name was Morton. Well, Apparently, in digging through the family, they discovered that uh, another aunt had sent to my grandmother, um, what do you want him to be uh, considered a box of salt? So she never bothered to change the paperwork. And he grew up with the name Milton. Storytelling has value to it, but there's often twists and turns that uh, documents show different and um, or, or have a separate life alongside storytelling. I agree completely with you about the multiplicity being important, but I would also say that that story is so much more interesting. Oh, 
gosh, am I even on? Yes, I am on. <laughs> uh, I, I turned it off and I forgot whether I put it back on. Sorry. Um, but that story is so much more interesting with the comment about the salt, which certainly wouldn't be in genealogical research. That's true. You're right. <laughs> it's interesting that you bring up uh, stories being passed on orally down through a family, Lisa, and how the what one believes about one's past may not be the actual case. Uh, you know, in reading this book, um, I don't know how many of you are aware that there was a considerable amount of uh, blowback from historians about the uh, central thesis of the book. Uh, the book was written over 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. since then, there's been an awful lot of uh, response to it, uh, mostly from historians who have suggested that the idea that quilts were actually used in the Underground Railroad uh, belongs more to the realm of folklore than historical mm -hmm. fact. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and most of what the authors of the book based their uh, premise on is the story of an African-American quilter, quilter that Jacqueline Tobin meets, who is repeating oral history that was passed down to her from her mother and to her mother from the co-author, uh, from Ozella's uh, grandmother. And you just gave a perfect illustration about how, you know, oral history kind of twists and turns. Uh, Raymond Dobard, the uh, other co-author of the book, even writes in his introduction that what he and Jacqueline Tobin came up with here is a theory. Um, he says that uh, we were able to formulate a theory of how this quilt code may have worked for slaves escaping on the Underground Railroad. While we believe that our research and the piecing together of our findings presents a strong viable case, we do not claim that our deciphering of the code is infallible. Um, so, but what has happened, uh, despite a lot of you know, criticism from fairly eminent historians about this, is that it has come to be accepted as fact among a lot of people who've read the book, you know, because it is a very compelling story. Uh, I would very much like to believe it, but I have my doubts. Uh, and just before I read this book, I had read something. Uh, I was reading a book, uh, A History of Brooklyn, called uh, Brooklyn, the Once and Future City by Thomas Campanella. It's a rather fascinating book. And uh, in one part of it, he describes uh, an incident that occurred during the Battle of Long Island when uh, Washington had to retreat uh, from Brooklyn uh, and uh, they were losing badly to the British Army. And a group of Maryland militiamen were fighting a rear guard to cover the army's escape. They were slaughtered by the British. Uh, but over time, there came to be a story about how the militiamen were all buried in a mass grave. No one knew where this mass grave was exactly, but a lot of people had theories none of these theories ever proved to be true. Uh, and it w went on into the 21st century when drone technology was used to scan uh, the surrounding area. And they thought that they had detected uh, from the air uh, trench-like patterns. They said, that's where it's gotta be. Well, it wasn't. They dug there and found nothing. 
Uh, but the author made a very uh, interesting comment about how these myths and stories came come to be given credence. And uh, what he said was, when a tradition is compelling enough, evidence of the truth is often willed into being. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you were aware of, you know, the response to the book. Uh, and, a, you know, uh, so I just wanted to introduce- George, you know, there, there was some, uh, to go along what you were, with what you were saying, some some uh, people, the reviews that I read said, well, the certain stitch, I don't remember what it was, you know, wasn't done that day. One of the books, one of the books yeah. that was being referred to is a, a slave quilt. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that the author did was in times to say, you know, I know that there's controversy over this, um, but, um, you know, it could be that in certain regions that existed where in other regions that didn't exist. And um, but one of the big criticisms though of the book is that there are, there have been actually uh, firsthand narratives of uh, people who were enslaved at the time who did uh, escape along the Underground Railroad. Uh, these were recorded um, like in uh, during the 1930s and uh, are part of uh, the Smithsonian now. Uh, quite a few uh, what, what they call slave narratives and uh, none of them mention quilts. Hmm. So uh, th those slave narratives were taken down by white people. This is true. This is true. So but you they were, have to consider but, who, who was involved in recording this, what, what biases may have been involved when they were, rec were recording. Someone may have mentioned a quilt and they may have left that out as a not interesting detail. We don't know because we weren't there when it was recorded. We don't have direct, like, because these are not necessarily direct from the slaves, the former slaves themselves. Um, and I mean, if it was that secret, they may not have trusted white people enough to impart that information. Um, I. There's a reason Ozella didn't, didn't tell uh, the author of the book the, the first time she came back and said, hey, I know I wasn't interested, but I'm interested now. And Ozella basically sent her on a, on a quest to go get more information because she needed the cultural and historical context to be able to really appreciate the information that was about to be imparted. Uh, can I ask a question? Because now Frederick Douglass could definitely read and write. I assume that Harry Tubman could also, but the, those those uh, the Af the African Americans who could read and write, don't we have some narrative from them? We do, but it's it's less common. Um, if you're talking about number wise, that is yeah. that is a very small drop in the bucket. Yeah. Well, uh, you bring up Frederick. Douglas, one of the historians who is most critical of this theory uh, is David Blight, who is the author of uh, the recent uh, biography of Frederick Douglass, Fred Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. Uh, you know, I'm not saying the book is without value because I, I think uh, their descriptions of the various quilt patterns are very interesting. I also uh, like the way she emphasizes how uh, the enslaved persons uh, brought with them their cultural and metaphysical traditions from Africa. They did not lose them and that they, they continued to uh, apply uh, those cultural beliefs uh, in in the new world and they, they did survive. I just don't know that uh, 
we can accept at face value that quilts were used uh, as part of the Underground Railroad. I mean, I would, I would love that that was the case because it does make for a great story, but just because it makes for a great story doesn't mean it's history. I, I don't necessarily think anyone is taking that at face value. Um, I think the important part of this book is, is that it did bring to light that quilts are worthy of study and you know, in their storytelling aspect and whatever inf other information they can provide. Oh yeah, they're absolutely uh, mm -hmm. worthy of study, sure. Uh, but uh, if you think that people aren't actually taking it at face value, uh, it has crept into the curriculum of uh, schools, uh, certain schools across the country, particularly in Massachusetts, and being taught there that as fact, um, you know, so it, it, there's a danger to believe everything uh, you read or hear. Uh, and, you know, I George, think there it are was a lot worthwhile. Of that are, there are a lot of things in history that are taught as, as fact that may not be the entire story, either from omission or from a, a different uh, uh, point of view. And uh, I mean, that's going on in our, in our country right now. People have different points mm -hmm. of view about um, the dynamics of uh, the social and political um, chaos and strain that's going on in the country, not to get involved in today's politics, but just to say, if you take today and you project it to the future, there will be different people who will be reading in different ways and will look back into the books and say um, that was the perception of some, but clearly there, to have all this civil uh, unrest, there was another perception that was driving that. So, and, and you know, just the fact that women are almost invisible in, in uh, mm -hmm. the history um, is, you know, clearly we existed at the time and we're having an input, impact on time. Um, Dolly, I don't know if, if you want to share, but Dolly has a, um, who, Dolly is a, a, um, a writer and, um, and a, a collector of, uh, of antiques. And you have a, um, a, a quilt that you, you believe that you bought at a similar market that was uh, told to you to be a slave quilt. I don't know if you uh, what, are you interested in me? sharing that or not. Yeah, I'll be glad to. I've pulled it out and put it on my television to, to show. Thank you. Um, um, I haven't figured out how to make, oh, there it is. Okay. So I guess if I turn this, nope, that didn't do it. I'm trying to figure out how to make my camera flip the whole thing so that you can see, not me, but see my uh, quilt. Hmm. Just, turn your, just pick up your iPad and turn it around. Okay. Uh, well, I knew that there was that option, but I thought the other one might be better so that both could be going on. Um, anyway, let me say first what the story actually is that I know. What I know is that I bought this decades ago in Crowley, Louisiana, which is far south, southern Louisiana, very much Cajun land. And the woman I bought it from said that she bought it in South Carolina as a slave quilt, or at the very least, it's made of slave stockings, made of black slave stockings. And I'll, I'll walk up to it and you can see it and then see it in more detail. Can you see it now? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I also sort of flipped the back so that you could also see that. I have no idea anything about what I'm sure that fabric is also probably telling, uh, but you can see it's a very free form, very artistic quilt. Yeah, um, it's quite beautiful. It's, I, it's, I, I, it's wonderful that you bought it. That's a treasure. I'm, I'm so thrilled. I loved it. It's with all, I've moved into a condo uh, in three years ago and I'm telling you, I had to give up so much that I loved and treasured and I'm so glad I didn't give this up. <laughs> Even though it's honestly just in my closet, I haven't really 
I haven't really known what to do with it because I have so much other art that, that takes this takes up a big space. But anyway, I'm trying to move so that you can kind of see the various imagery, the vine and the, I guess tulips and butterflies and stars and maybe cherries. And then in the Dolly, mostly we're seeing the top left corner at the top oh, oh, four okay. squares. Thank you so. for telling me that. Y'all have to tell me because I can't see it. Okay, point uh, down a little bit. Point okay. down a little bit. There you go. Okay. Okay, you see moon, butterfly, cherries, and in the center, there, there's clearly a center to it. I mean, I didn't have a big enough space to down pull it. again. I didn't. Well, I'm trying to show you the center. Can you see the center, the, yeah. which is like a like an iris or something like that? Um, if you notice, there is a very clear center focus of this. Let me turn it this way, just that, so that you can see that there's sort of an oval. Kind of like a vine going around. I mean, it's very creatively done, very, very masterfully designed, I think, and um, uh, composed. And of course, it helps to see the whole thing to appreciate that part of it, but I'm doing the best I can to show it to you. We're, we're seeing the painting to the right of it now in your grandmother's okay. chair. Okay. Okay, go down okay. and then to the left. Okay. Oh, and you see, there's actually a couple of little holes there. I hadn't noticed that. Oh, dear. That It's amazing there's not more holes. But, but by the way, be sure you notice the black that it's put on because that, that surface, I mean, that, what do I call that? The, the format or the, the canvas, essentially, that it's put on is very clear, clearly not one exact identical identical fabric but rather multiple fabrics all very similar as socks would be you can can you see the texture is there enough can you actually see the texture because it's it's smooth in some areas and ribbed in some areas i'm i'm quite sure that these are slave quilts that part i mean slave stockings that part i I'm fully convinced of. I have not found, I, I was, I'll tell you this really quickly. I was broken hearted when Lisa told me about this book and I checked it out, although I haven't been able to get it yet. I have purchased it. Um, and the first thing I learned was this man's name that had been the scholarly influence on the book. Checked him out. He sounded absolutely wonderful, and I was absolutely going to contact him. I was even a professor in Loyola, and he's from New Orleans, and it looks like he's Creole, and my husband was Cajun. You know, there were just all these connections that made me feel totally linked to this man. He died last year, and I was so mad at myself that I had waited and, you know, and not followed this up. Anyway, that's enough taking enough of your time, but I thought okay, y'all so we are we are getting to one o'clock. So does anyone have any questions for me before we wrap up or any other points they want to make? Thank you. If we have a minute to talk about next meeting, Amy, I'll be glad yeah. to, but I don't want to interrupt any more um questions or final comments from you or anybody else. I don't I don't have any final I don't have any final comments. I think this was a, a pretty, pretty good discussion. So I enjoyed the discussion. I did learn a good lesson, though. I, I wish I had done some more research as I was reading, because there is lots of times a broader story and that helps you to understand it or have a better perspective on it. But I, I really enjoyed it today. Thank you. Amy, thank you for bringing up metadata. I think that, that helps me a lot in looking at art in the future. Uh, and not just art, look at everyday objects. If you just look at, at that as pure information, it, it can definitely uh, teach you some stuff. Anyone else? Last call? Thank you for letting me visit. Of course. Sally. Away, Thank Alice. you for sharing. Alice, what did you want to tell us? So we, of course, have picked to read about I Am Pay next time and have several out-of-print books. But if you do have the book, um, I would focus on the chapters about the Louvre, the Kennedy Library, 
East Wing of the National Gallery. We're, we are going to think about our own museum again in honor of Jim. And also Cassandra has invited the Everson, which is designed by IM Pay to talk about the experience of their museum. So if you do read those chapters, look for references to it. It's referred to in all of those chapters. Um, but, and we'll send out reader questions. And, um, but just want to give you a little bit of an idea of what to expect. So it's going to be unusual. And um, I think you can get very involved in the discussion, um, just sort of thinking about our museum, I'm Pay's work in general, and, and that museum. So Amy, thank you for inviting a rich discussion today and um, a different way of looking at this book. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to just add that uh, the book can be gotten uh, secondhand on Amazon, but also uh, the New South Bookstore um, has offered to find secondhand copies. And I found that the copy that they were able to get was uh, about 50% of the price of what Amazon was asking for secondhand book, the secondhand book on, on IM Pay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Alice, can Cassandra send us, or can you send us the chapters that you said we need to look at? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. With 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 some reading notes, uh, questions, we'll we'll make that clear. Okay, Thank you. And and again, don't worry if anybody has a hard time tracking it down can generally familiarize yourself with ideas, but he's a great writer. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So, Amy, do you want to excuse yourself for a moment and come back and have a follow-up chat? Sure. Okay. Because, yeah, I've, like, drank a whole bunch of water because that's <laughs> what I do when I'm nervous. So <laughs> now I have to pee. <laughs> Only Paula Susan heard that. That's fine. I, <laughs> Our first participant. She knows. Don't, all. Just don't put this part up on the internet. So. Okay. <laughs> okay.